Hey guys, uh, welcome to the last um, track, the part of this track. Um, Mark Thomas is going to tell us something about a practical use of Servlet 3.1, especially implementing WebSocket. Thank you. Right. Okay. So what's this all about? There's a whole bunch of um, new non-blocking I/O features in Servlet 3.1. And there aren't that many real-world applications out there that are using it. So what I wanted to do was use the fact that Tomcat's WebSocket implementation is built on top of that to sort of show you a real-world example of how to use that API and discuss some of the gotchas and problems we, we came across whilst we were doing that implementation. So I'll talk a little bit about WebSocket, what we're trying to do, <laughs> what our aims were, um, then see how WebSocket mapped to Servlet 3.1 and why it was actually a pretty good map and then talk about the complicating factors, wrap it up with a summary, and questions as usual, just you know, stick your hand up as we go along. Yeah, I think you've probably seen all of that. So, right, <coughs> WebSocket, the actual specification itself, it's defined in RFC 6455, and it's basically asynchronous messages. So whereas HTTP is request, response, request, response, WebSocket, either client or server, can send a message whenever they like. It's completely bidirectional. It's completely asynchronous. There are three types of messages. They can either be text, binary, or control messages. There is no state management. There's one connection between the client and server, and that's it. There, there's no sort of um, there's no, no kind of cookies or anything like that. It's just the messages going back and forth. It starts off with an HTTP upgrade. Um, so when you look and see a WebSocket URL, a non-secure one rather than HTTP will start WS, um, HTTPS will start WSS. The thing to note is if you're actually tracking that with um, sort of a, a network analyzer or Wireshark or something, the initial connection is actually an HTTP connection. You will never see a WS URL on the wire anywhere. It's, it's an initial connection, it's an HTTP connection, you see the upgrade, and then you just see raw data flying back and forth. That's more, the WS notation is more of a notation to tell the client, yeah, this is going to be a WebSocket connection rather than an than HTTP connection. So I said there were three types of messages. The text and the binary ones are the real fun ones. Um, all the text stuff is encoded as UTF-8. We'll come on to why that's entertaining a little bit later. And a message can consist of one or more frames. And there's a very generous limit on the size of a single frame of 2 to the 63. And there's absolutely no limit on the number of frames you can have in a message. So message sizes themselves are totally unlimited. Um, which obviously, if you're planning on buffing the, buffering the entire message at memory at some point, that's going to be problematic. That's really an approach that just isn't going to work, um, depending on how, what you know the client's going to be sending in terms of messages. Control messages are much easier. They're limited to 125 bytes. The interesting thing is they can be sent at absolutely any time. So if you've got a, a WebSocket message uh, that's split across 10 frames, you could have some control messages in there. What you can't do is have um, multiplexing of messages. So you've got to do all of one message, then you do the next message, then you do the next message. They have to be done serially. You can't multiplex them. That's an extension. Um, look, when I last checked, it was draft. It might be final now. And that's something that Tomcat needs to look at implementing. We don't yet. So as f that's sort of WebSocket, the protocol, and the sort of things we need to worry about when we're implementing it, point of view. Um, for the JSR356 API, then there's a few more requirements. There's no requirement to build on top of server at 3.1. Um, that was something we opted to do but to make it container independent. Um, we might be changing that decision. Uh, that's a discussion for the Tomcat Summit on Friday. Um, and to, to explicitly avoid a dependency on the server API, the HTTP session is passed in, but it's passed in as object, so there's no explicit dependency between the two. It has two configuration styles. You can either do it completely programmatically, or you can do it with annotations, or you can, you know, you can mix and match. And it provides both a client and a server API. And the client API is essentially a subset of the server. So what we wanted to do with our implementation, we obviously wanted to be compliant with the specifications. We wanted to be container neutral. That meant we had a build on top of Servlet 3.1. And there's a question, well, is there a performance cost of that container neutrality? Uh, yes. Is it significant? Performance, it doesn't appear to be when we look at it in a profiler. There's more of a cost in terms of complexity and maintainability. 
and that's as more of a driver for why I'm thinking we might want to get rid of it. So in terms of mapping to the server 3.1 features, so we know that WebSocket needs a single persistent connection. So in terms of scalability, if we want lots and lots of connections that aren't active very often, then that sounds very much like non-blocking I.O. to me. We certainly don't want to do that with blocking. The messages are also asynchronous. Yeah, that's non-blocking I.O. So the server 3.1 non-blocking I.O. API definitely looks good. Um, and for scalability, yeah, it, it has to be non-blocking. Because you've got this one connection <coughs> per client, if you use blocking I.O., then that's one thread per connection per client. So you can only support as many clients as you've got threads. That's horribly inefficient. That doesn't scale. It works, but it doesn't scale. Um, we need to, the WebSocket connection itself starts with an HTTP upgrade. Well, yep, server 3.1 HTTP upgrade then. That's, yep, that's a nice mapping. And we need to be able to process annotations for configuration. Well, there's the annotation scanning that was introduced in server 3, so with the server container initializers, so we can use that. So there's actually quite a good match between what you need, <coughs> the features you need, or the building blocks you need for WebSocket, and what you get with the server 3.1 API. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. Uh, annotation scanning, so you implement servlet container initializer, you ha add a handles type annotation, and then when the container starts, or what, sorry, when the web application starts, the container calls the on startup method of the initializer, passes in the servlet context, and all of the classes it found that um, implemented the, or ha matched the um, annotation, the handles type annotation. So for WebSocket, our servlet container initializer looks like this. So we look we're interested in server endpoints, application configurations, and endpoints. And it's server endpoints for annotated endpoints, because that's the at server endpoint annotation. It's endpoint for programmatic ones, because they all have to um, implement endpoints. And also, there's this server application config, which is there to enable you to filter endpoints. If you've got a application that's got, or you've got a library that's got 10 different WebSocket endpoints in it, and you only want to enable two of them, you configure an application, uh, server application config that says, I only want these annotations to be processed or these endpoints to be made available. So you can just turn off the ones you're not interested in. Oh, annotation scanning. You need to scan every single class for, for matches to handles type. It's relatively expensive. Don't want to do it if you don't have to. Um, and as I was talking about in, the, in my last presentation, the specification language wasn't clear. Tomcat wasn't quite right, um, so the, the options we sh we needed to sort of minimise this weren't weren't quite. So we had to um, fix a few things. So the SCIs and containers were always scanned. I mentioned that before. An interesting one with discovery is you've got to follow the web applications class loader delegation model. That means if you've got an S if you've got two implementations of the same SCI, one in the web application, one in the container. It's the web application, certainly if you configure Tomcat by default, it's the web application one that should be used in preference to the one in the container, unless you switch the um, delegation flag around. Interestingly, um, and this is something that came up on the Tomcat users list, there's no specification requirement for the order in which SCIs are invoked, which now means it is impossible to ensure that I want this piece of code to be the first piece of code that runs when a web application starts. You can't do it anymore if you're using SCIs. If you're not using any of the annotation stuff and you do it with just with web.xml, yeah, that's fine. It's the order the listeners are defined in. But you cannot do it if you're doing stuff with SCIs. And that, I think, is something that needs fixing in the um, server sector. Some stuff like security, you might actually need to run first. Um, We've talked about that earlier, or at least in the last presentation. Let's just skip over it quite quickly. You can exclude jars. That speeds up the scanning. Metadata complete doesn't help you with SCI scanning. You need to use the ordering to clear those out. OK, let's talk about some new stuff then. HTTP upgrade. It's a feature that's added in server 3.1. To use it, you implement the HTTP upgrade handler interface. and then your application calls HTTP, or rather the container will call HTTP servlet request upgrade to process the, the, the actual upgrade. Once that upgrade response has been sent to the client, at that point, all HTTP back and forth stops. The init method is called on the upgrade handler. That passes in the web connection, 
and then you use the web connection to process the input and the output. The fun bit we'll come on to in a minute. Um, yeah, actually, a couple of, couple of fun bits. First of all, this is the interface, and you've just got this one init method <coughs> um, that passes the web connection. And that web connection, as I say, just gives you access to the input and output streams. Th there's a whole bunch of stuff you might need to pass to this upgrade handler in, in order to initialize it. And there's no API for doing that, so you just get to make your own up. Pick your favorite way of doing it. Um, this is the method that gets called to actually trigger that. So again, you you're actually passing in the class, not a instance, which means the upgrade handler has to have a zero argument constructor. It was done this way to keep the CDI folks happy. So again, um, you've got to worry, okay, I need, you need some other method to get any initialization in information into that upgrade handler. The fun bit with web connection is you've only got access to the input stream and the output stream. You don't have access to the sockets. So things that might be really useful to set, like timeouts, you can't. There's no API for doing it. That's really annoying, as we'll, as we'll see later. Um, we've talked about the zero-hour constructor. We've talked about the output streams. Um, da -da -da, yeah, that pretty much repeats the various issues I've mentioned as we go along. So Tomcat, we've just said, right, well, we're just going to have a pre-init method. Um, so when you call upgrade, you get the, the actual upgrade handler instance back. So then you can just call pre-init on that instance and add any information you want. So Tomcat, we part, send a whole pile of stuff for WebSocket. The endpoint instance, the configuration, the WebSocket container, da -da 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 -da, and so on and so forth. Basically, everything we need to pass across all gets passed in that one call. We could do it in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different calls. Uh, we could create some object that wraps all of this stuff up and pass it across. Yeah, free to do it however you like. We just decided to do it this way. So the non-blocking I.O. We've got our servlet input streams and our output streams, and we now need to do non-blocking I.O. with them. It's a new feature, again, in servlet 3.1, and there are only two, type, two places you can use it, either with an upgraded connection or within asynchronous processing. And once you've, with an upgraded connection, once you've switched to non-blocking I.O., you cannot switch back to blocking. Um, and that, again, is another gotcha that will, um, well, it certainly bit the WebSocket implementation. Within, there's, there's a slight caveat there within asynchronous processing. So you go into asynchronous mode, then you go to non-blocking, and then you're in non-blocking mode until the point where you, you either dispatch that <coughs> asynchronous context or you complete on it. Then you go back to blocking again. So you can go back to blocking, um, sort of, with asynchronous but you can't do it at all with the um, upgraded connection. So given that we've got a, a number of um, APIs and API styles for non-blocking I.O., what we really need is another one. Excellent. Here's the server API for non-blocking I.O. So, oh, there, it's slightly different. Um, and then WebSocket defines its own slight differences on top of that as well, which is great fun. But so. The extra methods we've got in input stream are, is it finished, is it ready, so can I read some more data, and setting the read listener. And the read listener is what um, gets called when th there's data to process. So on data available obviously gets called when there's data to read. On all data read tells you, okay, yeah, you've finished reading all of the data on the input stream. And on error it calls when, so obviously when something goes wrong. So in order to... What, in order to start the non-blocking I.O., what you need to do is you set the read listener, and that's the thing that triggers the switch into the non-blocking I.O. mode. So you set the read listener, and then the container will call on, on data available at some point in the future when there is data to be read. Then and only then are you allowed to read from the input stream, and you can read once and once only. Um, read twice, bleh, bad things happen. Um, if you're lucky, you'll get an illegal state exception because we've caught it. Um, if you're unlucky, then things get into a very strange state or you might end up blocking when you're not expecting it. What you must do, what you're meant to do is you read, then you call is ready, and you must either is ready will return true, in which case you must read again, or is ready will return false, in which case you must wait for the next on data available method. So if you read from the input stream and you call is ready and is ready returns true, 
and you don't do anything else, well, it just sits there. It's waiting for you to read. You have to do your own read at that point. Um, it will never call on data available until is ready returns false. If you don't follow these rules, it'll either say it basically sits there doing nothing, waiting for you to do the read, or it'll throw an illegal state exception. Uh, talked about that, and yet when you get to the end of the stream, on all data read is called. So output streams look very similar, but there's no on all data written method because you're as the application developer, you're expected to know when you've written all of the data. The application, the API certainly doesn't. So there's an is ready and there's a set write listener method. The rest is all pretty similar. Um, you've got an on write possible in the write listener and a, and an on error. And basically it's the same set of rules. You set the write listener, that kicks things into non-blocking I/O mode. The container will then call at some point in the future on write possible. You would normally expect to, it to call it pretty much immediately, but that's not guaranteed. It will call it when it's ready. Um, and then again, you can write once and once only, and then you've got to call is ready before you do the next write. If you don't do that, you get an illegal state exception. And again, if it returns true, you've got to write again. If it returns false, you've got to wait. And you must absolutely follow those rules. If you don't, again, you'll either get the illegal state exception or the whole thing will just sit there waiting for you to write data because it's told you it was ready. So, you know, come on, get on with it. Um, and on write, that on write possible is it will write data and it will not block. Or in terms of the API will not block, what's going on under the bonnet, it does not mean that the data has been instantly written to the client. It means that the data is there. It's, it might have been written to the client. It might have written one byte to the client and the rest is sat in a buffer and the container will send the rest of it when it's good and ready and then it calls um, on write possible again. Uh, so, in terms of how we implement this in WebSocket, we've got a WebSocket read listener and it basically, in on data available, whenever that's called, it calls the WebSockets frames, which is our representation of a WebSocket frame. It says, yep, there's data to read, and then that, that object will read the data that's there and then populate as much of the frame as it can. And if it's got a complete frame, it says, right, here's a complete frame, go and do something with it. Or, okay, the frame's not complete, I'll just wait until there's more data. And so it just waits for on data available to be called again, then it reads the rest of the data, fills the rest of the frame, and off we go. Um, within the frame, it's a little bit um, more complicated. So here we've got, this is our on data available method. We've got read locks. And you think, why on earth have I got read locks? Um, surely the container isn't going to be stupid enough um, to call this method, you know, have multiple threads calling this method. It isn't, but. And the but, and it's this one of these sort of edge cases that catches you out with the non-blocking API if you're not careful. Think about what I said about how this works. So on, da on data available is called. So I know the first time through, this is, yeah, is ready is definitely going to return true. That's fine. Da -da -da. We do our read. Da -da. Okay. And then we get to this again. And we've read all of the data. So is ready returns false. Okay. So I'm further down here. But the, now at any point, the container is free to call on data available again. Because as soon as is ready returns false, there can always be another call to on data available in a different thread. And depending on what else you are doing in this method, you might not actually have finished the cleaning up for processing this read. You might not have finished processing the number of bytes read and adding them to some sort of internal total. There are all sorts of things going on here that might not have finished reading. And then you suddenly get, oh, another call to on data available because miraculously the client has sent some data just after is ready returned true. So with these, that you'll see in the WebSocket code, these synchronized blocks just to make sure that we really have finished this read before the next one is processed. And that caught us out when we're doing the WebSocket implementation in a couple of places. It, you do a simple test, it all works beautifully. You put it under load and you occasionally start getting this real weirdness going on. Like, what, what, why is this being corrupted? It's like there's two threads processing at once, but that cut, then light dawns. You think, ah, yeah. We've called is ready, therefore we might get another call to on data available. So we have to make sure that whatever's going on in here is finished before the next one's called. So that's what that 
that read lock is doing. And there's a similar thing on write as well. Um, which I think I might have, have I left it off this one for? Yeah, I've left it off this one, but it, it is there. Um, so on write possible, again, what it's ready, have we completed, essentially there's a whole WebSocket maintains a whole pile of buffers. Uh, so it basically keep, get, empties all of those buffers and treat, keeps trying to empty as many of them it, as it can. If it empties all of them, it, it returns. If it doesn't, then it just waits for another write call to on write possible. Um, this little bit here at the bottom is fun. Because we can't get to the socket, we have to implement our own timeout mechanism. So what we've got is if we haven't completed all of this right, then we get the send timeout. And I'm not going to go into details of where we get that configuration from. And if it's greater than zero, we basically register this particular um, output. So we're saying, right, register that for a timeout. And basically what that's saying is if we don't write to it again, in this timeout time, then it's going to throw an error and trigger the trigger closing it down. But we basically had to implement our own timeout mechanism. There was no other way of, of doing that. That's one of the things that if we ignored the let's build it on top of servlet 3.1 and go directly to the Tomcat internals, we could just, yeah, ignore all of that. But if you're writing an application that's using non-blocking I.O., you are going to have to implement your own timeout mechanisms. You have no choice. Um, or you can lobby the servlet expert group to put some sort of timeout setting API in there. Um, I will certainly be lobbying the servlet expert group for that in, in the next round. Um, as I'm on the expert group, you might hope my voice would carry a little bit of weight, but the more people like you that s stick your hands up and say, yeah, that's a really useful idea, then the better. OpenJSR mentioned that you can, everybody can participate in JCP these days. So when Mark goes up and says we should add this, you can all comment yes. on the, J the JIRA and say plus one. Absolutely. And that really does get things added. So, so we've talked about this. Um, I've talked a little bit about the issues with that lock. Essentially, there are, you have to really be thinking about writing code in a multi-threaded way. You, this isn't one of those things where it's not that bad. I'll just write it single-threaded, and then I'll think about multi-threaded later, and I'll add a few volatiles and the odd sync block, and it'll be fine. Um, you really have to be thinking about what's going on with the thread safety. You really have to have in the back of your mind, okay, as soon as is ready returns false, I might get a call to the on data available or on write possible. I need to make sure I handle that. You really do need to have that front and center when you're writing your app that's using the non-blocking I.O. And you've got to test it and test it and test it. Um, so some complicating factors. So we've got all the different styles. There's the servlet 3.1 read listeners and is ready. Read write listeners is ready. The WebSocket API has got futures and send handlers. It decided to use both. Yay. Um, and for reasons I won't go into now, um, Tomcat uses <coughs> asynchronous socket channel on the, on the client side. And the short version is it was a really good match for the features we needed. Um, so, and we needed to convert between all of those. So futures, we always convert to send handlers. That's fairly simple. Um, Server-side send handlers are always then mapped to servlet 3.1, and that's okay-ish. And on the client side, send handlers are mapped, are com mapped to com uh, completion handlers. So there's a little couple of utility classes that do the mapping. It's just a, it's a nuisance. You've got all of these different styles around, and you have to convert from one to the other. It just adds layers that you really wish you could delete. This next one was just one of those things where I just want to walk up and just get me, find my TARDIS, go back, convince the WebSocket expert group this was a really bad idea. Um, the WebSocket API allows you to choose whether you want to send a message using blocking I.O. or non-blocking I.O. Well, that doesn't sound too unreasonable. Yeah, but we're building on top of servlet 3.1, and that doesn't allow you to switch from non-blocking back to blocking. And it really is square peg, square peg, round hole. So you have to simulate blocking. OK, well, that's not too bad. We've got completion handlers or send handlers, and we can do weights on those and effectively cause the thread to block. So that will be all right, won't it? And you, you basically do this. Um, we, can, we use our future to send handler converter. We start the message. We send that handler there. And we basically then just write, just sit here and on this 
send handler get. This is basically where we're blocking. We're saying, right, wait for this send handler to complete. That's OK. That'll work. No. Um, why doesn't it work? Well, I've talked about that, so I won't talk about it anymore. This is the problem. So what's actually happening under the hood? So we want to write some data. We'll think about the application writing out to the client, OK? So this thread over here is going to write some data to the socket. That's OK. It writes the data, OK? Some of the data is sent to the client, but for whatever reason, the network or the client can't take all of it. So some data is left in the buffer. So this socket says, oh, I haven't finished. I need to register with the polar to write data. Um, and that polar will trigger a callback when, the, when it's able to write. Meanwhile, um, yes, and then we repeat that basically until the buffer's empty. That's OK so far. And the block, as we said, is with that simple latch. It works if you're on an application thread, but when it's the container that's doing this writing, there's a problem in that the server API and the server implementations are written based on the assumption that there's only ever one container thread working with a socket at any one time. And in Tomcat, that was, inf that was strictly enforced uh, with a sync on the socket. Um, and it, the reason it's done that way is before we did that, the server 3.0 async processing was an utter nightmare, very buggy, very unstable. Um, and it was, again, it was to do with these um, multiple threads being triggered in events and stuff. So we put that lock in and it fixed a whole bunch of problems, but it causes problems for WebSocket. So we've got a WebSocket detection, uh, connection, and the polar detects that there's data from the client that we can read, okay? So that the polar passes the socket to this thread in my right hand to read that data. Um, container reads it, and it eventually gets to point, okay, I've got a complete message, I'm gonna pass this to the application. Pass it to the application, okay. The application says, right, okay, I want to write a message back to the client. So it writes a message using blocking, but that message is too big for a single write. So the message is partly written to the client, the rest goes into the buffer. The socket get, gets sent back to the polar to register it for a write, and the application, this sits on the latch, wait, waiting um, for, the, for the write to complete. Meanwhile, the client processes the data, the polar says, ah, oh, we can write data again. So it passes up to a second container thread, says, right, go write the rest of that data. The container thread says, right, well, in order to do that, I need access to the socket. Um, I can't do that because this thread over here has got the lock. But this thread over here is never going to release the lock until this thread writes its data. But this thread won't write its data until this thread <coughs> releases the lock. Oh, hello, that's a deadlock. And you're stuck. Um, and you just can't get around this. I mean, once that happens, those threads are blocked. There's nothing you can do. So we discussed various options. Um, the first one was something that Remy called automatic blocking. And the idea was that if you don't call is ready, then you get a blocking read and write, and it kind of happens automatically. Remy claims this doesn't end up in deadlock, but every time I think about it and work it through, I always end up with the possibility of a deadlock. I'm not convinced he's right. Um, I'm not convinced he's wrong either, but he hasn't convinced me that he's right and I'm definitely wrong. So. Um, another option we thought about was um, if a client wants to write data, force it to always do it on a separate thread. Um, then it, it won't be on a container thread, it won't be holding the lock, so the container will be able to process the next write. That's really clunky, and it will not be obvious to people like you who are trying to use this. Say, Why do I need to do all my writes on a separate thread? Why can't I just write data? I've got the socket, what's the problem? Um, it sh that should work, but it's clunky. It's not obvious why you have to do it. It wasn't tested, oh, and it would need um, some API changes. So the route I decided to take in the end, and the other option, of course, is don't go through the serverless API, go directly to Tomcat internals, and then I just set the right blocking, right non-blocking flag. It's really, really easy, which is, again, one of the reasons why I want to get rid of a lot of this complexity and go directly to the internals. But what we did for HTTP upgrade was say, okay, we'll actually let one container thread be processing uh, incoming message and a separate container thread allowed to process a, an outgoing message. So you have one thread allowed to read a socket, one thread allowed to write a socket. And with that, it sort of breaks the implied one thread per socket rule of the server API, but that's not actually written down anywhere. 
the, the spec hints at it, suggests it, implies it, but it doesn't actually say in black and white, there must only be one thread per socket. Um, and this is what I, what I tried first. It did actually work. There were a few little threading issues um, I had to deal with, but actually not that many. I think there were two, sort of two or three line code changes just to fix it. And that works. So now what happens is you've got your thread over here that's basically blocked. What, although it's doing a read, it was actually initially, this thread was triggered by the web application doing a read of incoming data. The fact that it's then doing a write is kind of irrelevant. The important thing is it was doing a read. So it's then blocked. The next thread that comes in, next thread that's dispatched by the container, that's being pro dispatched to do a write. So this one's doing a read, that one's doing a write. Both can coexist. This one finishes off the write, that releases the lock, and then this thread can finish and finish off the read. And that, it does work. Um, the next complicating factor was generic types. Um, when you've got WebSocket message handlers, you can basically you can get them to handle different types of message, and these can be strings, longs, your own objects, and there are various rules about how you convert the WebSocket message to the, to the object. But the, the important thing here is the container has to be able to work out ex what class is that. I it has to know. Um, and that's where it gets interesting. If it's, if, if Foo implements message handler holster, that's fairly easy. Um, a little bit of reflection and you can get hold, okay, I'm processing strings, that's okay. This is handling strings, therefore it must be, it must be handling text messages. It's a text message handler, that's fine. Everybody's happy. If bar ex then extends foo, that's okay. It's, it's manageable. Where it gets interesting is where people do stuff like this. What exactly is that a message handle for? Um, yeah, what is it for? Okay, so x maps to c, x, x. That's actually y, so it's a Boolean, I think, probably. I need to double check that. Um, but it, it's working your way up that generics structure. It, again, it's possible. There's APIs to do it. Um, what you can't do is where you, but you've basically got to get to a point where there is definitely an absolute concrete class. What you, what you can't do is if you just left this as a... Um, as a... Um, just a generic, you know, I know, Z or whatever. And then when you created the instance, you specify what Z is at that time. At that point, you, yeah, the, there isn't enough, inf because it's done at runtime, you, the information isn't in the class, so you can't work your way up the hierarchy. There's just no way of working out what, um, what instance that's using, at which point you just say, no, can't do it, won't work, give up. Um, yeah, if you really want to look at the, the fun and games you have to go through to work out exactly what those are, then have a good look at this method in the source code. Um, I'm not going to go through it. What I will say, it's one of those things where you probably want to have a wet towel on, on hand to wrap around your head as you're working your way through it. It's definitely a lot easier to have some concrete examples and debug your way through it than try and just look at the raw code. Uh, next complicating factor is UTF-8. Uh, WebSocket text messages are always UTF-8 encoded. Tomcat uses the Autobahn test suite, which is a brilliant test suite. Um, and it's got lots of tests for UTF-8 handling. The problem here um, was you use the UTF-8 decoder provided by the JRE, and you suddenly get a whole bunch of, U of failures. You're thinking, what's going on? Surely Java's UTF-8 decoder does actually know how to decode UTF-8. Well, generally, yes. Edge cases, not so much. Um, it's better in 8 than it was in 7. Um, but there are still a number of cases that it doesn't handle. Um, and then we wrote some test cases and we found a few more. And it comes down to this. Uh, it, it accepts sequences that it shouldn't. Um, there, there are some blocks that aren't meant, that, that, that yes, they technically exist, but there aren't any, there's no valid um, character at, the, at those code points, so you should never accept them. Uh, and it lets them through. If you've got invalid UTF-8, you're meant to fail on the first invalid, but as soon as, as soon as you detect a byte that means, it, okay, the rest of this has to be invalid, you've got to fail at that point. You can't say, well, okay, I've got a four byte sequence, so I'll read all four bytes and then work out that the four bytes are invalid. If you should know by reading the second byte that it's invalid, you have to stop at that point, say, right, that's invalid, chuck it away, start again. Um, 
And because it was swallowing more bytes than it should, then that meant that wrong numbers of invalid bytes were detected. Sometimes too many characters were swallowed, sometimes not enough. There weren't enough replacement characters. All sorts of issues. Um, the bad news here is writing UTF-8 decoder isn't that easy. The good news is Harmony had already done it. Um, the Harmony project might have been killed, but the code is still available under the Apache license, so we can just go and copy it. Interesting, that also had a couple of edge case failures. Nowhere near as many, but it still had a few. Um, but that one I can actually fix the bugs in, so that's what we've done. Um, and then we switched all of the Tomcat's UTF-8 handling <coughs> to use the new decoder. I did raise this with, the, um, with Oracle at the time, and basically the bug got ignored. Um, I raised it again a little less um, tactfully when they started asking us today about um, testing with Java 9. It was, well, yeah, you know, I'd raise, there's this bug, I'd raise it, but pff, last time I did it, you ignored it. So, this, so we got a, yeah, sorry about that, raise it again and I'll make sure it gets through and gets seen. So hopefully we'll start to get these things fixed. Um, it should be back ported to 7 and 8 as well. Whether it will, don't know. Uh, on the client, uh, this was more, less of a server API thing, but the asynchronous socket channel is great. There was just no SSL support. Um, do a quick, when I did a Google for it, basically the only information I could find was somebody going, don't want to do that, which wasn't really what I wanted to read. But actually, doing it from scratch wasn't too bad because we could just steal a lot of the ideas from the NIO implementation. So, in summary, we built WebSocket on top of Servlet 3.1. That was doable. We made heavy use of the non-blocking I.O. If you want to use that non-blocking I.O. in your apps, then hopefully I've given you an idea of some of, some of the blockers or some of the complications you might hit, hit up against, things to be aware of. Obviously, you, know, you have to worry about timeouts, handle that yourself. Um, you need to worry about threading and being really, really, really careful and make sure you're very mindful of exactly how the API works when you do it. Um, and you've also seen some examples of how some of the other features work. And generally, they work pretty well. It was the, the non-blocking I.O. and getting that working, and particularly the switching to the blocking, which was um, more complicated. So if you do use non-blocking I.O., don't try and mix non-blocking and blocking. Just stick with non-blocking. Your, your lives will be a lot easier. Uh, the source is obviously all freely available if you want to have a look at it. Um, and we do have some time for questions. One at the back there, Jason. Yes, I did backport it to 7. And is the next question going to be, but there's no server at 3.1 support in 7? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not actually, um, all you really needed was the HTTP upgrade. And we'd already um, hacked that in for the proprietary WebSocket stuff in okay. 7 anyway. So all we've done is, all you have to do to, to use it is rather than using the um, HTTP servlet request object, you just have to cast it to Tomcat's internal object and then access the upgrade method. Oh, um, okay. But other than that, uh, how did we do the, yeah, the rest was then, from that point on, it was all basically just copies of the servlet API classes, but just in a different package, so we didn't cause any, any complications. So we had our own input, rather than using the servlet input stream and output stream in the web connection, we used some other input stream and output stream, probably from the Coyote package, but I forget exactly where. But it was really just the upgrade bit, which was the really hacky bit, and we just moved some of the, the API classes around. Thank you. Right, if we've got a bit of time, um, I know that was fairly dry, and I wanted to finish the day with a bit of fun. So, uh, if you haven't got your laptops out, and you've got them with you, or you've got a phone that's capable of doing WebSocket, now would be the time to, to get that device out. All right, and then we'll see, how, we'll see whether or not we can break my laptop. Okay, right. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, that was the one that wasn't working. Right, okay, no. Okay, that failed, right. I uh, don't want that. Okay, right. Uh, da, 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 da. Lose that. Okay, CD, yeah, IF. Right, um, need an IP address first of all. Where are we? There we go, right, that's the IP address. It's 10.11.6.173, and you're gonna want port 8080, but don't hit go yet, because there's nothing listening. CD, uh, repose ASF. Port 
public tom tomcat trunk the output have been yeah that would that wouldn't be so good and I better turn the firewall off, otherwise nobody's going to get anywhere near this <coughs> machine. Firewall. Right. This is not an open invitation to try and hack this machine. <laughs> Sorry. Since when does it get an invitation <laughs> for <a> hack? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. So, what was that IP address? <laughs> yeah, uh, 10, 11, 6, 173, right, 10, 11, 6, 173, port 8080, right, Have, can people get hold of the um, Tomcat homepage? Has at least one person got it right? Okay, you want to go to the examples? WebSocket examples, multiplayer snake, right, how many snakes can we get going? Right, come on, kill the snake. Ah! <laughs> oh, <no>. oh. <laughs> right. Oh, um. Yeah, and then you need to use the arrow keys to move the snake around once it's um. Oh, I almost got somebody. Oh, dead. Did you use a touch library that way? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, this is just a bit of fun to finish the presentation off. I was going to run it on one of the Apache servers, but because um, you need Java 7 for WebSocket, and we're running FreeBSD, and I tried to compile Java 7 for FreeBSD, and it just did not want to know. So yeah, uh, nice, to know, nice to know it works with reasonable numbers of users. Cool. That's better, All right. Well, uh, which one's me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well that, ah, whoever that was, well, sorry I just killed you, but you were looking far too long. <laughs> okay, so, well, we've been playing with that. Any other questions about um, or Tomcat generally or the um, building the using the, the non-blocking I.O. or any of the other new server 3.1 stuff? Yes. What do you think the resolution of uh, the, the, the server leak or the, the WebSocket EG's resolution is going to be for the uh, synchronous versus asynchronous thing? Um, you know, they, they said they tend to have a problem with changing their minds. They, they can't move backwards and only move forward. I mean, the blocking, the non-blocking? Right. Yeah, we, we've, we've shot ourselves in the foot. What's likely to happen? That it's just going to be a mess forever? Um, well, it, it's only a mess if you try and build on top of the server API. Okay. If you've got access to the, um, the underlying I.O. code, it's norm certainly in Tomcat, it's trivial. Whenever you do a write, one of the, one of the parameters is, is a Boolean block, true or false. So I think what it's more likely to do is drive, it, it, it strongly discourages people from doing container neutral implementations. Because whilst Tomcat's implementation is container neutral, it only uses the server API, it assumes that the container will let you have a concurrent read and a concurrent write thread. I do not know if that assumption is valid on any container other than Tomcat, which kind of negates the whole container neutrality bit, really. Um, so either you need to handle that um, handle that in the server API, or you WebSocket just says, yeah, we're just not even going to try and be container neutral, just give up. And to be honest, given the complexity, I'm kind of leaning towards giving up. And here's an interesting question. Does anybody here see a need for a container neutral WebSocket implementation? Would anybody here want to take Tomcat's WebSocket implementation and drop it in another container? Sorry? Uh, yeah, but you could, you, yeah, okay. Not exactly neutral, you take the interface to it. Yeah. I thought you wrote your own. Well, we have two different uh, versions of the uh, uh, server implementation. We have the uh, one client uh, 8, we have the new one, 
Okay. I've got a slightly different perspective on that whole kind of like, is it portable or not thing. Like in the JCP, we don't have any way as users to add tests to the CPK. And no. If, if we could, we could maybe you know add tests to that had that would challenge to make sure that you actually had two different threads in your read and write. Yep. To see that that was portable. But we're just we're not we're not delved into the portability uh, story as users. And or even as implementers, because we can't add tests to here, nobody can. Yeah, and the the way the TCKs are managed, there's a there's a long list of things I don't like with it. Yeah, I'd uh, really like to see a test addition process. I'd that I'd quite so like awesome. I'd like to see a little bit more open source Bullshit. approach uh, for the for the tests. Um, but I can I can kind of understand why Oracle doesn't want to. There's a lot of money tied up in. In that, and they, they they make an awful lot of money from the yeah. from the I've TCKs. Open source TCK for a very long time, but now I'm starting to think that the more pragmatic approach is just to simply allow the test to be added. Well, even even if you say okay, the it's rest of test is not yeah. a bad thing. Or you say actually it's not open source, but it's it's sort of semi open that anybody who's got a TCK license, well you've got access to the source anyway. But there's a there's a shared area, you can contribute patches, you know, that, that you could sort of open it up a little bit like that, and that, that would make a big difference. Um, Part of the TCKs now written are in our Killian, the testing premise I sort of mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. the CGI and Beam validation part of it is written in Killian. If they would at least accept those tests, users could say, here's a test that modifies, a, uh, represents a bug that I found in my server, can you add it to the CPK? It would be great if there's at least something like that. Yeah. The other option is you say, oh, blow that, we'll just write our own TCK. That one's illegal. N what, no, it's not. We haven't, we haven't got a valid license with Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> that one's illegal when people have signed a license. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I, that's kind of the ultimate fallback if the ASF Oracle discussions don't pan out the way I'd like them to. But I would, actually, I would much rather have Oracle's TCKs and be able to contribute into them than I would to write my own. Definitely. We have open JSRs now. We have the ability to file JIRAs. And, and you know, I showed like the connector thing earlier. Mm -hmm. That actually got like 30 votes on the JIRA, and that's why it got into the, into the spec. So when Mark says, I want to fix something, please vote for it. Like, it does make a huge difference. Yeah, but it's certainly that the whole process is more open than it was. We still have a ways to go. Yeah, that, yeah there's, there's lots of things still to improve. But it's better, um, and it'll be even better when we've got access to the TCKs again. Okay, well, it's coming up to the end of the day. I think it's break time, and then it's followed by the um, the, uh, the, 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 the keynotes. That's the word I was looking for. So thank you for your attention. Any other questions, you know where to find me. Thank you.